So our next section, uh, Carol Patak and I are going to debate demand driven, give you very different perspectives. And I asked Jake Barr to be our MC for this. And many of you will know Jake. Jake's not a, you know, surprise to many people because he's been with us for a long time coming to conferences. He was 33 years with Procter & Gamble, very much uh, an active team member and leader of building that guiding coalition under Laffley for the two moments of truth and defining what demand driven means. He's recognized as one of the architects and it's not a stranger to the supply chain world. So I'm going to invite Jake to come to the stage, talk a little bit about demand driven, and then he's going to ask Carol and I to come up and we're going to have an active debate about two different but similar views of demand driven. Jake? Good morning. Here's Thank your you. clicker. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, come on, guys. We're just short of lunch. <laughs> right? I mean, I know Laura scared the hell out of you of talking about bringing your laptops and trying to do work, right? So now everybody's in a, f a fear factor mode of going, oh, my God, my numbers are going to suck next to the person next to me. We have an absolute treat for you this morning. What, what we're going to attempt to do is to navigate what I call the great debate. Now, the great debate comes on the principle of the fact that demand driven is alive and well I might add no matter what you individually may think in fact I will prognosticate for you just like a few of the colleagues from yesterday that by 2025 the few companies that are winning and that will likely be back here in the room with Laura I will be on the golf course talking about this are ones that will embrace the knowledge that winning will be agilely taking advantage of a network of networks. Well, I want to let that sink in for a second. Agilely taking advantage of a network of networks. Demand driven in the journey was never about just doing sensing. It was about re-engineering all the way back from the outside in the supply chain so that we could take advantage of market-based opportunities in the near term and leverage the cap capabilities of a broader set of enterprise-wise partners. And those include all your upstream suppliers, et cetera. Now the caveat here, and I use boxing gloves, is we all have a different take, a slightly different perspective of the point of views. And I'm honored to honestly navigate the debate because I think it will be helpful for you to get some perspectives about the journey. And I want to underscore that word, the journey, because this is not something that the weak of heart wake up one morning and just decide that they're going to undertake. This is about something that ultimately is driven by business need. Now, Carol's I mean, Laura said, actually, I've been around a while, so I'm going to tell you that I do claim to be the godfather of part of the work inside P&G, along with a lot of my other colleagues that are here since also retired. But what we shared in common was the knowledge that our business model was not robust enough to address what our chief supply chain officer and, more importantly, our chairman of the board, A.G. Lafley, was trying to do around our business plan. Guys, we don't run charities. We support charities. We have philanthropic efforts. We want to make the world a better place. But at the end of the day, if we can't deliver our business objectives and we can't employ our people and we can't bring, importantly, what we do to market. So as the godfather role that I'm going to play is I'm going to lay out a few ground rules for you. First, I'd like to just give you a grounding in how did we get here and where are we? I'd like to build off of that by giving you a perspective of I think there are some key barriers to progress that today limit or severely handicap people from really give, being able to deliver a breakthrough for their company. And some of them, quite frankly, are not that complex. Third, I want to get both Laura and Carol's view on the take of a couple of key questions to kind of give you food for thought as you walk away and you go back into those leadership team discussions at home. 
how can I take advantage of what I heard to maybe set us on a path to where we put in place the first brick on the ground? Because it is a journey. Guys, I want you to understand that at the end of the day, your take on this is the most critical thing because you have to live and breathe your own company environment every day. We don't. Everyone's is unique. There's no two that are alike. I think that the, the presentation that you just heard a moment ago was a perfect example of where a firm stepped back, assessed the market conditions, said, you know, the model we've used won't be exactly what we need to get to the next hurdle rate and to allow us to take advantage and shape where the market is going, shape where the market is going instead of being a player in it. So then we'll close out with a couple of, I call it gifts, takeaways of what you should think about. So how did we start, right? How did we get here? So I want to take you back to a, a dim, dark days of what I call 1999, sitting in a room with the chief supply chain officer and our chairman of the board, A.G. Lafley. We're in the midst of talking about what had, at the moment, looked like a very generic exercise of trying to determine, A.G. asking the question, look, I've already promised Wall Street that we're going to double the number of markets we're going to be in, geographically, regionally, and double the number of brands that we're going to make available for the consumers, and we're going to do that in 10 years or less. So we were reporting back on a state, current state of affairs of how the supply chain was orchestrated, how we were organized to do the work, and what the grand totals of what it was going to take to be able to do that. Now, there were a few of us sitting in the room, and I'll never forget AG's reaction to the first piece of information. We actually gave him a reality check on the number of sheer bodies it was going to, people, that it was going to take to just simply take the size we were to get to the size he wanted to get to. It wasn't a very productive reaction. The second reaction he had was we were giving him a current state and then we were extrapolating what our in-market position would be around our service levels on the scale up. And to this day, it stuck in my head. He goes, guys, thank you so much. And I'm going, God, we're, we're not even to the punchline yet of what we need to do. And he said, thank you very much. I've actually now found our $25 billion brand. And I paused for a second and I go, okay. Because the aggregate sum of all of our out of stocks totaled a billion dollars when you looked at the scale factor. Epiphany. How could we take the two moments of truth that AG wanted to talk about? The first moment of truth being there and available, whether it's a kiosk in Bangladesh or a hypermarket in France or a food retailer in North America, it doesn't matter for the purchase decision and then the use decision because he had quickly and very eloquently surmised you can't win with a repeat purchase if you're never there for the first moment of truth. So for him, it was about how do we build the agility in the end-to-end -end supply chain so that we could actually turn what was a business opportunity into a competitive weapon. Now, the moniker of that that we started using inside the company was this thematical pounding of the table of a consumer-driven orientation. So guys, let me help you. We were no more consumer-driven than any other firm on the planet. We were disconnected. We ran long cycles, both in production and planning and how we sourced materials, our inability to read what the market was. But we had made a conscious decision from that day forward to take it an inch, a foot, a yard, a mile at a time around that loop and improve every single one of those processes. Okay? Now, I will tell you, it's been a grand total of 16 years since that work began in earnest. But its moniker of what it's about competitively has never changed inside those four walls. And to be able to get there meant we had to make some conscious decisions around the loop. I will tell you, I spent hours with a lot of our IT and our business supply chain and our manufacturing folks sitting out in a desert in Los Alamos, New Mexico, running simulations on a Cray supercomputer 
to answer a few questions that AG had asked around if we could take all the point of sale data around the consumption of all of our movement and have it available to us every day, can you build a model and tell us how we would run all of our machines and what we would need to do with all of our suppliers? Now, it was a great academic exercise, but what it really did was it unlocked and peeled back how we could start making definitive progress on each of those things. How we would change the way we began working with, for example, all of our key ingredient suppliers in terms of cadence and call-offs. Oh, by the way, how, as a world-class manufacturer of consumer products who was recognized at the time as being best in class and cost, how we could actually cycle shorter, more agilely, sounds like SanDisk, right? To be able to meet what has been a very non-predictable consumer demand trend. Segmentation, anyone deal with multiple channels, right? They were exploding at the time and they have continued to explode. So what we were trying to do was really look at some very simple strategies. First, how do we synchronize the cadence of the processes that you execute every day? I would submit to you, you wanna take job one, easy step, lay out on a value stream map how you do each part of your processes every day. If you're planning materials monthly and you're planning production monthly or weekly and they're not in sync, match those up, take one step. You can then move to day, you can then move to shift, you can then move to hour. Second, new age metrics. Uh, brilliant breakthrough. When you want different operating performance from your production sites, you just cannot reward them on completion of a quantity of production over a 30 day time period. That doesn't match what's selling in the market. You have to tie in stock levels to it. You have to do the same thing for your quality organization, on and on and on. Third, we had a giant sp spaghetti bowl relative to technology. None of it connected. None of it streamed to feed each other. None of it cadenced off of each other and it took the better part of five to seven years to just begin with the help of some outside players helping to construct that. Now we had the benefit of some great counsel, so along that ride we had folks that honestly were, have been in the room that have been talking to you for the last two days, folks like Laura and uh, Roddy Martin and his previous. What they gave us was a sounding board to be able to say, okay, we discreetly think these are some of the steps we need to take how would we go after that? And then finally, I want to uh, touch on a talent, uh, a talent element because Laura brought that up at the beginning of the conference. And guys, this is more true today than it was even when we began the work. The supply chain leaders and the people that you need to drive and execute this work are very different from a traditional set. The way they think, the way they make trade-off decisions, the way they go through and think about organizing and putting the cadence of a work together is very different. So you have to think and spend some time on the talent. Now there have been multiple definitions for demand driven over the last several years. Now we were lucky, I wanna go back to a comment that Laura made at the start of the conference. Sorry guys, when you're a pioneer, there is no such damn thing as a best practice. You are creating it on the fly. You are doing many experiments where you learn your way through and then replicate and scale when it's successful and dust off and put it in the back of your pocket when it doesn't work. All of these, to me, honestly, you can use any name you want. What they share in common is the integration of the end-to-end -end supply chain that goes beyond your four walls, involves your partners that where you sell services or goods, where you source services or goods, and how competitively you wanna shape the market. Call it what you want. Call it ice cream for all I care. It makes no difference. If it's about you being more agile, about you connecting everything, and then more importantly, from a business standpoint, and I give credit to Laura for this one because it came in midstream and it was one of those good epiphany points It gave us another poke in the back to say, oops, you, we might have thought, not only can we get ahead, oh my God, what would happen if we actually wanted to shape? What would actually happen if we could make the supply chain quick and agile enough 
that we read it fast enough that I could actually unleash chaos on the market to my benefit versus reacting to somebody else's chaos. Sounds good. I have to tell you, being in the driver's seat, much better than being behind. Second, when you think about these definitions, make sure you don't fall into the common traps. First, it does not mean that you're making everything every minute of the day. It means you can agilely move through the lineup based on a cadence and a sequence. There still, in a demand-driven environment, is a place for buffers. Strategically. They're not everywhere. They're only in a couple strategic. And I'm going to tell you, you need to question them every year because you can continue to drive down your reaction times, the process outages that cause you to keep them. Second, it's not just simple pull. And importantly, it doesn't mean you've got stacks piled to the ceiling everywhere. If you've got that, I'm telling you, you're investing more people and more cash than you need to run the business. It does mean that you're making a commitment to sense what's going on to the market. It may be not totally integrated. It may not be driving how you run what, on your, what you do on your production schedule this afternoon from what's sold this morning. Don't get panicked about that. You don't have to do that. It can be a time lag to it but you're dialing it down, making progress against that. And importantly, it also, and this is to Carol's credit, I want to make sure you understand, you cannot do this alone. You must have a cadenced, quality, predictable, reliable process you're using not only for your own processes in production, but also for all your partners. Think about it, if you're gonna go on this journey, but you're not investing in the reliability engineering and the process capability of what your suppliers can deliver to you on a cadence, uh, you're going to probably find another pile someplace. So I want to kind of give you a, a, a general concept, and it's kind of the approach that we canned over uh, the time frame of a crawl, walk, run. Think about all those journey points. Do you know what's selling in the market? Probably not, okay, what's your crawl step? Can you actually plan on the same cadence daily versus monthly versus weekly? Okay, crawl your way, way toward a progress step there. So the important piece is it st starts with a base of getting the house in order. It starts second day by saying, if you don't know where everything is in your supply chain, um, mm, hard to do this. Third, you've got to be able to connect these silos, uh, getting them to an external focus, rewarding people on that. You've got to start thinking, I hate to tell you, but the world is becoming flatter as we speak with boundaries that go away. You've got to think more in an airport control tower where you're navigating and controlling and preventing the planes hitting each other, the conflicts every day. So have we made enough progress? on any of those areas that would allow you to really dynamically day-to-day? -day. I would submit to you, no. Has there been major progress made? Absolutely. We drug not only solution providers kicking and screaming along with them, some of them actually came to us and we greatly have benefited from that to simplify the journey. We had to deal with strong cultures. We're 180 plus year old firm and had our own ways of being successful, you have to change some of that. So you have to deal with those. So I'd like to ask Carol and Laura to come up today because uh, now, because we're gonna get into a point counterpoint of, you know, what's our take on it? But I wanna crystallize a couple of areas for you to think about. First, I think there are three fundamental gaps in process, technology, and organization. And my questions to these two ladies are gonna focus in on kind of driving those home. Underlying it, though, is a, a trump card. If you don't address your culture inside, it can squash and trump any piece of progress that you do. So let's start with a more basic premise around business efficiency, which is what this is all about. At the end of the day, you're in it to make money. So let's start with a basic one. So Laura, Carol, thank you. I told Laura I was gonna bring boxing gloves, but then I decided it probably wouldn't be a good idea. So, first question to you, open. Demand-driven, alive and well or not, and how does your definition of it 
Has it morphed? Has it changed? Is it still changing? It's still changing. Uh, I think Carol and I agree that it's about independent demand. It's about what's selling. I think that um, when I was at AMR Research, I did a lot of writing around demand sensing, demand shaping, uh, and took it to market driven, which is really end to end. Um, what I've really focused on is more of how do we use market demand and what I'm thinking a lot more about now is the translation of demand. I do not believe that demand driven is about integration. I think it's about harmonization and synchronization and the design of buffers and the design of cycles. And um, I also don't think we get there with today's technology. So uh, I think it's about sensing, translation of demand, and decreasing of demand latency on independent demand. Carol? Okay. Well, it's interesting. To me, the definition that you showed with uh, the Orlicky book there was actually a definition that was written in 2003. Mm -hmm. That was actually written by yours truly in the middle of a crazy time. Isn't that sad? It is sad. And it hasn't changed. And I think that's really the critical thing, is that we had this vision while we were at PeopleSoft we coined the term demand-driven manufacturing, and that was our definition. I still have the original posters and marketing. We spent over $5 million marketing that term. So here that definition has not changed since 2003, and I appreciate you putting up the slide where it said it's not inventory everywhere, it's not make to order, it's not, because that's the feedback that we got from the analyst community at the time. When we briefed them on demand-driven manufacturing, they said, you guys are crazy. It's never going to work. It's just inventory everywhere. It's just make to order. You guys are nuts. You know, it's not going to work. So it's interesting to me that that PeopleSoft definition in 2003 is still the same in 2015. I think we've just started our adaptation to demand-driven. Yeah. I think we're just realizing now how to do it. Because the reality is, is I had the vision of what was demand-driven manufacturing. I knew sort of it was that way. But it wasn't until I partnered with my co-author on the Orlicky's third edition that he was totally separate, working with his team on something else, trying to solve a problem that they started to violate all the formal rules of planning. Because he was a theory of constraints guy. And he's like, yeah. well, you know, we just keep tripping over the material planning side. So we've got to change the formal planning systems. And so when he came to me, after the Oracle hostile takeover in PeopleSoft, I decided to go scamper up to the ivory tower for a few years and teach. And he came to me at the university and he says, I want to show you what we're doing. We think it does this. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, it does that, but it also does this. It solves system nervousness. It solves bullwhip effect. It is the realization of the vision that we had at PeopleSoft in 2003 for demand driven. And I agreed totally with Laura. The current planning systems cannot do it. They are fundamentally flawed. It's not that they don't work. It's the inherent assumptions underneath the those assumptions. systems. It's the assumptions under the so systems. So Carol, let me, let me transition you guys into a, anytime you're pioneers and you're starting to recognize that the business world around you is becoming more chaotic and, and changing faster than you're capable of keeping up it obviously causes some to start getting some epiphanies earlier than others. Mm -hmm. So we've got a broad scale group in the room, but if you were to say today from your unique perspectives, what's the one thing that you see that has been so difficult for firms to get over to be able to embrace and make progress? What would it be? I'd like to jump on that one first because it okay. is a favorite soapbox of mine. And I think the presentation yesterday by General Mills was brilliant. Yeah, and that yeah. is, is transforming the idea that the number one driver, the rule number one, is not cost per case. That was brilliant. The shift that happened in that organization, because they understood it's about return on investment. If you're in any kind of publicly held company or any kind of for-profit enterprise, that's really what it's all about is that transition of cost is not the number one driver. That makes us do all sorts of stupid stuff. It's not driver. the only driver. Sorry? It's not the only driver. It's one of a series of things that you cost? want to address. Yeah. I'd put cost off the table. Bingo. Absolutely. The absolute fundamental principle behind man-driven is all about flow. And that's why 
Uh, this conference, thank you, Laura, for inviting me to be one of your bloggers, forced me to actually get a Twitter handle for the first time. I mean, they've been trying to drag me into Twitter for years, and that's my Twitter <laughs> handle, is it's all about flow. So yeah. thank you. But that's really what it's all about. Cost comes later. It's a result, not a focus. So Laura, what's your spin? I think that um, we have lost our ability to think about demand driven by constraining our thinking. We think the supply chain needs to be integrated and efficient, which is totally opposite to demand driven. We have put our IT investment into systems that do not support demand driven logic. And so we're spending 1.7% of revenue on IT systems that are largely legacy. And because we really have trained all our people to look at MRP and DRP signals so blindly, we have not really thought about independent versus dependent demand and outside in processes. And we're not where I would like to be in the development of demand driven processes, but I think we're starting to see some innovation in this area, which I think is really good. I think Carol's work with Demand Driven Institute and the work they're doing on how do we rethink flow is really, really promising. And she's got a certification process. Maybe you can talk about that a minute. Yeah, we do. What we've done at the Demand Driven Institute is how do we operationalize demand driven? And first, let me be really clear. As the Institute, we do no consulting. We do no technology, just so be very clear. We're thought leaders around the idea of demand driven. And what we've done now is we're leading this consortium, this very large group of like-minded individuals that say, how do we do the education, the consulting, the technology to enable demand driven? Because it's not just about being able to sense better demand signals. It's how do I operationalize that across a multi-echelon system? Because understanding that supply chains are nonlinear, they, therefore they can't be optimized. It's a word that absolutely makes me twitch every time I hear optimize or if I see a teeter-totter drives me crazy. Because supply chains are complex adaptive systems. We heard a wonderful presentation this morning about the uh, social media and how things adapt and adopt. Lenovo did a great job yesterday. That's supply chain. As soon as our supply chains shift, so we have to have the tools. And I'd like to call out the orchestrate folks that are here. They're DDMRP compliant. They've put in the tools. So just like in the early days of MRP, if you learned what Orlicky wrote in the first edition, you could pick up any MRP system and use it. Orchestrates earn their DDMRP compliant that says anybody that's learned the tools of demand driven can pick up their tool and use it. And I think that's critically important because we have to shift the tools. But ding, ding. But Let's move to the next one. Yeah, well, I want to say right. one other thing. Carol, but if we think about the intersection of lean, constraint, and flow, yes. I think we've got to come to peace with that. And I think that's where a lot of organizations struggle. Yes. Absolutely. Because we also cannot throw out MRP. It's, it's got to be a solution that brings in the Six Sigma side. That's where I thought Lenovo's presentation was absolutely brilliant because you have to think in terms of managing with the flow, managing within certain control limits. And, but yet, where do we bring in lean? Where do we bring in, and how do we bring in faster responses? How do we bring in theory of constraints? Where do we put the strategic decoupling buffers? And then how do we plan the material? This is a multi-echelon system, I, and we have to manage it as a system. Well, I want to manage you into the next question, but I, I would submit to you that in 2025, the people that we have working in supply chains are going to be network orchestrators. They're going to have the skill sets and the supporting tools that allow them to not only be able to numerate those trade-off decisions, but have the tools help them get over the hurdles of what had to be learned in 30 years of very uh, time-consuming technical work at a shop floor to be able to understand some of those principles. I don't know what you think, Carol, but I don't think that's true, Jake. I no. think that that's what I'd like to see. But you know, when I look today, you know, I've got 19 companies that are implementing demand sensing. I've got probably 98% of the world that's hard coding ERP and putting all their investment and energy in that. You know, the primary movement of data is EDI and it's email, right? We've only got 7% moving Amen. through business networks. And people ask me all the time, what's the return on investment of a business network? Why should I 
invest in a canonical infrastructure for many to many and why should I share data and have a system of record with suppliers, right? I think what we do is we push cost and waste back to the suppliers. We haven't done as much in supplier development. So I'd like to believe that's so, but I don't see the behaviors. I, so, I have seen these so concepts Laura, that's wrong the next time. question. It was yeah. a great setup. So okay. what's the one thing you're going to be looking at? Because we have partners in the audience yeah. who actually have to help us get to that end state. Uh -huh. So what's the one thing you're actually asking them to focus on and help to deliver over the next five years? I want them to focus on outside-in processes that use independent demand and synchronize to minimize the bullet effect. And I want them to really embrace the rhythms and cycles of the supply chain. How about you, Carol? Well, I think the first thing that when we talk to companies and we educate companies in demand-driven, for us it's about how do you institute the buffers and very quick, easy ways to drop an inventory buffer in so that it absorbs variability it decouples that lead time, and it improves your return on capital employed. But that means it has to challenge what we call thoughtware, how you think. What happens in here is the toughest part of demand-driven, because we've been operating under what we call deep truths, which actually I enjoyed yeah. your Einstein slide yeah. because it was yeah, a it was a email, but or not an email, but a communication between Niels Bohr and Einstein. And they said a deep truth is something that absolutely everybody believes, and is absolutely and unequivocally false. Amen. And the only way you can replace it is with a deeper truth. And some of the deep truths that we deal with today, inventory optimization. What's the deep truth under that? Well, to have better customer service, I have to have, better in, have, to have more inventory. False. In order to have better demand signal, I have to have better forecast. False. False. Drove me crazy after PeopleSoft and an analyst group took what we briefed on demand driven, put it into a pyramid, and at the top of their pyramid put, put improved forecasting. That's crazy. That is non-relevant. What should be at the top of the demand-driven pyramid is improved return on capital employed. So I think where we need to start, the thing we have to address first, is our thoughts of supply chain. What can I do easily today? And that first step is an inventory buffer. Very different than safety stock. I want to make sure everybody gets that. Safety stock is a supplementary position of inventory, never intended to be used by your planning system. A buffer is a primary position of inventory that absorbs variability, decouples lead time, improves return on capital employed, which challenges that whole deep truth of saying, well, the less inventory I have, the better off I am. And that's false, because you can have too much inventory, and that's the classic definition of waste. But if we have too little inventory, that's also waste. So somewhere between too much and too little is just right. How do we get to that just right? So but my deep truth is I need to manage you back to closing out our question. Yeah. So I'd like to give you Don't, a is this five, a challenge? I told you it would be. <laughs> That's why I told you I was going to bring the boxing gloves. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we need them for you. I yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Laura and I have been doing that for years. So I want you to sum in five words a compelling thought to leave them with. You want to go first? Words. <laughs> Always go to the host first, right? Outside in, synchronized, buffered, responsive, and new ways of thinking. Carol? Okay. I would say sense and adapt, strategic inventory buffers, mitigate variability. Okay. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Guys, I want to leave you with a parting thought, and it's just in the in-game big picture of this thing. If you want to believe that there hasn't been progress, I want you to wrap your mind around these points. When we began this work, there was absolutely no roadmap that could help any firm in any industry vertical understand a maturity model and a way to, to make progress. Second, the top 25 rankings shed light, although I totally disagree with how the rankings are now managed, I'm on record, but it provided some active benchmarking for others to reach out to, to get ideas from. Third, we disagree on the amount of progress. I think we all agree on the fact that there's not been enough progress there have been some breakthroughs in supply chain technology solutions that have inched us closer to
to being able to support the viability of the business model perspectives we're offering here. Fourth, no one really truly understood that you could run a business outside in. There are demonstrated, acknowledged leaders that you can look to to get ideas from today that didn't exist then. I don't want to diminish the fact that it's also brought and shed a light on how many companies now have changed their processes for how they're developing their talents and the leaders to drive and lead these breakthroughs. It's not the same-o, same-o. Folks are looking at where they're getting talent from. They're looking at a different way of progressing and building those leaders because when you start talking connecting people to deal with all the way from upstream suppliers to commercial interactions in the marketplace and have the depth in things like manufacturing and procurement. It's a whole different skill set. And then last but not least, I think it's, it's honestly triggered new process monitoring techniques. It's given us a whole different way for how to have people more visually engaged with their daily work. Is it perfect? Is it where it needs to be? No. I want to give credit to Laura for the work that she's done on, again, metrics that matter because it's driven people outside their normal comfort zone to embrace these pieces of, wait a minute, I'm sorry, but my first assignment with my company was to work as a production line leader. And oh, by the way, I was taught, run it long, never let it stop, and it's the perfect condition. With that, I'll thank you. Thank you, and give a hand to our panelists. Thank you, Chris.